Welcome to Staying Remote, Returning to Work, or Both, uh, Legal Considerations for Nonprofits. Um, we are so glad to have this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, my name is Jennifer Prozinski. I'm a partner in the Labor and Employment Group here at Venable, um, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Walter Calvert, who is a partner in our tax group, and Robin Burroughs, who is an associate um, in our Labor and Employment Group. Um, Next slide, please. So with mass mandates being lifted and businesses across the country reopening, many nonprofits are asking, is this the right time for us to reopen our offices? And at the same time, they're asking, should we permit employees to telework on a permanent basis moving forward? Well, today we're here to answer those questions. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about our goals for the program today. Um, first, we're gonna have Robin speak a little bit about things your nonprofit will wanna consider if you're trying to determine whether now's the right time to tell your employees, hey, our offices are open and you're gonna start needing to report to the office for work. And of course, because reopening your offices, unfortunately, is as not as a simple as reactivating your employees' key cards, Robin is also going to address some of the issues that you may encounter when you announce your reopening decision and how best to address those issues. Um, and then for those nonprofits who are still trying to decide whether the work for, workforce will have some type of permanent telework component after the restrictions lift, I'm gonna talk about some, some considerations you'll wanna be thinking about. I'll also be talking about ways you can approach structuring and administering a permanent telework component, as well as some of the employment laws that may come into play with telework arrangements. And then finally, Walter's gonna close the presentation by talking about potential tax implications of having a remote workforce. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Robin. Thanks, Jennifer, and thank you all of you for being here. Um, really excited to talk to you today about office reopening. <laughs> I know that this has been um, a topic that I've been thinking a lot about over the last year. I'm sure that it hasn't left your mind um, as the pandemic has drawn on and on that you may want to reopen your office and get back to normal. What does that look like? Um, so first today, we're going to talk about this really hard decision of whether it even makes sense to start bringing people back into the, the physical workplace and how to make that decision. Um, if most of your employees right now are working from home or maybe you have some operations that you shut down for the pandemic and are thinking about restarting some of those programs, we'll talk about these things you need to evaluate to make this reopening decision. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about vaccines today because vaccines definitely play a role in this analysis. Um, they are one great tool for preventing and controlling COVID-19, um, but they're not the only tool. So we'll talk about both vaccination and some other things that you as an employer have in your tool belt um, and things that you should consider in making this reopening decision. So, um, when you're looking at the, the question of whether you should even reopen your physical doors at all, we look at it as sort of a, a multi-question analysis. Um, so you need to think about the risks and the benefits, gather all the information that you can about how this would look and what you would need to do, and then ultimately determine whether the benefits outweigh the costs. Um, so kind of first in that information gathering process, you want to look at how well your current operations are running as a part of the remote environment. Um, have you been able to function for the last year with a large portion of your workplace being remote? Um, have there been concerns related to that? Um, maybe low productivity or low morale? What have you done so far to try to to alleviate those concerns? Um, and is there anything that you could do going forward to make those less of a problem? Sometimes, um, you know, if low productivity is the problem, talking with your supervisors or managers about how to, to work with employees to work on productivity issues or um, to manage managing remote employees a little bit differently might help with that and might alleviate the need to reopen your doors purely for that sort of concern. Um, Second, you would want to think about what actions you need to take before you would reopen, if that's the direction you're moving. 
review all the applicable laws, regulations, and guidance there is, and there is a lot <laughs> of guidance that would be um, necessary to look at. So you probably have thought about the CDC guidance. Um, there's also some guidance from OSHA, or if your state has its own OSHA, like Cal OSHA has a very extensive set of, of um, interim regulations out right now for open offices. Um, you'll have to look at your state and local health department orders and any other state or local restrictions like occupancy limits um, or things like that to decide what your office would even need to look like if you were to reopen its physical doors. Um, that may require reconfiguring some space, requiring masks or other more formal personal protective equipment. You might need to implement daily screening measures or testing protocols, um, temperature taking, having employees disclose any um, COVID symptoms they might have. Um, on the next slide, I'll go into a bit more detail about the kinds of procedures that you will want to consider if you're thinking about reopening your doors. Um, next, you'll want to analyze how much cost and effort will you need to expend to make reopening possible. Um, so there's definitely cost for physical materials like hand sanitizer and things like that, costs for modifying spaces, um, but there's an administrative cost in reopening as well. You'll probably have to do at least some supervisor and employee training. Um, you might have to put some new policies into place. You might have to revise some old policies like sick leave um, or anything remote work, things like that. We'll talk a lot more about those as the presentation goes on. Um, but it's not just a physical what you need to purchase cost effort. It's it's an administrative cost as well. Do you have people who will be there and able to administer your policies and to do so consistently? Um, you'll also want to think about what the risks are, if there are any associated with employees returning to the office place. Um, in the last year, we have seen some litigation over COVID-related issues and employee exposure. That often comes um, in looking like a negligence claim, like the employer was, was not taking sufficient precautions against COVID. Sometimes it looks like a discrimination claim or an Americans with Disabilities Act claim, an ADA claim. My employer did not give me reasonable accommodations for a disability I had that COVID exacerbated. Um, we've also seen, and you might imagine, an increase in OSHA and occupational safety uh, claims and investigations. Um, employees are making complaints to OSHA saying my employer doesn't take necessary precautions and then OSHA has to do some sort of inquiry into that. Um, and there's also some potential workers' compensation risk or exposure. Um, a lot of the COVID-related claims that we've seen over the last year actually are covered under workers' compensation. So um, hopefully you have sufficient insurance. If you don't, now is a before you reopen would be a great time to reevaluate if you're happy with your workers' compensation coverage um, and if you're sufficiently covered. Um, so you want to think about those risks as you're considering whether opening the office makes sense. Um, and then finally, at the end, just do these benefits that you think will come from opening your doors outweigh the cost and effort of the potential risks or the the things that you need to put into place to make it happen. As much as we all want to go back to normal, um, it's going to be very different to open your doors now than it would have looked in February of 2020. It's, it's you can't just open your building, um, even with vaccines, and have it look the same as it did pre-COVID. Um, we are just living in different times now. So um, as we go through our presentation, we'll try to touch on as many of these sort of differences and considerations that you should take into account when thinking about what to do with your employees. Um, but we can't possibly get to them all. Um, so if you have specific questions, um, you know, you can always put them in the chat or the Q&A and um, we'll try to address them. Um, or you can call your attorneys here at Venable to talk through your specific situation um, and run that risk benefit analysis analysis with you. Okay, oops, there we go. Um, so as you're thinking about this reopening 
decision, some sort of specific considerations that we've been seeing a lot more recently. Um, the first is the changing COVID-19 protocols and the applicable law and guidance. We have seen so much change even in the last few weeks in what the CDC is recommending as more and more individuals become vaccinated. Um, you're probably familiar with the recent CDC guidance saying that individuals that are fully vaccinated basically don't have to wear masks anywhere now. Um, that's a big change from just even a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so um, it, staying on top of guidance like that is really important. Um, but you also want to think about this in the context of your workplace. If you're thinking about reopening, how will that changing guidance impact the rules that you have in your office? Um, because you as an employer do not have to follow the CDC guidance in the same strictly to the letter. Just because the CDC says vaccinated individuals don't have to wear masks indoors does not mean that you as an employer have to permit your vaccinated employees to, um, to take off their masks indoors. Um, you'll have to make some deliberate choices about what your workplace is going to look like. And that may mean that in their personal lives, your employees who may be fully vaccinated will be taking some liberties that you might not allow in your workplace. Um, if you wanted to require masks for all employees in your workplace, regardless of vaccination status, that is a fine policy to have. But just think about how your employees will respond to that if they are not wearing masks all day in their personal life. Um, in work settings, we often suggest or make different decisions than we would that employees might choose for themselves. Um, and part of this is because as an employer, you have different obligations uh, than employees have for, you know, for their own personal decision making. Um, for most offices, OSHA would cover COVID under its general duty clause. So you as an employer have um, to furnish each of your employees with a place of employment free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm. And COVID is a recognized hazard. We know now that there's, you know, there are precautions that have to be in place and that you have to attempt to control for it. Um, so as the CDC has been updating its guidance, most of its updated guidance applies to employee personal choices and not necessarily to what you need to do in your workplace. So you have to look at that guidance and make these sorts of, of choices about COVID-19 protocols, um, keeping in mind the type of workforce that you work with, the if you serve any kind of public population, what that population looks like, um, whatever the updated guidance is for from your locality, your state, um, if you have a local or a state OSHA. Um, we expect to see a lot more of this guidance changing very quickly. So it's something that you'll have to keep up with as your office is, is reopening. Um, and Maybe you look at it today and think now is not the right time and the guidance changes in a week and you'll have to reevaluate, but that's the state of where we are right now. So um, do keep looking at that. Um, you might want to think as you're looking at what's required, you might also want to consider um, masking requirements. What are your masking requirements going to be if you were to physically open? Um, social distancing, can you do that in your office and what does that look like? Uh, staggering meal breaks, if that's possible. Um, quarantine, if your work requires travel and you are going to require employees to come into the office, what will your quarantine requirements be? Um, will they have to, to quarantine after work travel, after a potential exposure, after personal travel? Um, this is a choice you should think about before you start confronting these situations in real time. Um, and then what, will, how, what role will vaccination play for your employees? Um, we'll talk more about that in just a second. 
Um, and finally, who will enforce these policies? Um, you know, if you have a masking policy and somebody isn't wearing the mask, what will happen to them? Um, a policy or a requirement is only as good as how well you enforce it. If you put a policy on the books and then, you know, you never tell your employees that they need to wear masks, the policy isn't doing anything for you. Um, so you need to think about how you're going to enforce any requirements that you put into place. Um, and that'll include employees who may complain about other employees not following those requirements? Who will take those complaints? How will you investigate them? And what will you do about them after you get them? Um, so as far as vaccination is definitely changed the landscape for, <laughs> for office reopening for a lot of people. Um, vaccines are an incredibly powerful tool, um, but there's a lot that we are still learning about them. We don't know at this point how effective they'll be against any emerging variants of the virus. Um, and as you know, recommendations about vaccination from the CDC have been updated and changing very rapidly. Um, so it's it's not enough to just say, well, all of my employees, you know, my employees are vaccinated. We don't need to do anything else. Um, they're not the be all, vaccines are not the be all end all of this conversation. Um, but they can definitely be an important consideration for restarting operations and returning to the workforce. Um, you may want to think if you're considering reopening your office about um, whether or not you will have any policy about vaccination. So um, this can look like a very large spectrum of things. There's not a one size fits all policy for each employer. Um, it can range from not having a policy at all and just not addressing the issues of vaccines all the way up to having a mandatory vaccination policy. Um, and with a lot of middle ground for incentives or voluntary policies in the middle. Mandatory vaccination policies are permissible, so says the EEOC, as long as you honor religious and medical exemptions. Um, so if your goal is to have every employee in your workplace vaccinated, um, you can have a mandatory vaccination policy, but you will need to consider reasonable accommodations for employees who may have a religious objection to vaccination or a disability that um, runs counter to being able to get a vaccine. Um, we highly recommend having a written policy if you're going to have a policy at all, and your written policy um, should consider these um, potential exemptions or how you're going to manage these reasonable accommodations. Um, if you don't want to have a mandatory policy, you may look into having an incentive-based policy or a voluntary policy. Um, these can look a lot of different ways, but some common things that we've seen recently have been, have included time off to get the vaccine, additional time off from work, um, or monetary bonuses or incentives. Um, in order to get more employees vaccinated, where it's not a requirement, but maybe um, you get something extra if you do go and get vaccinated. Um, in considering what kind of policy you want to have, you really need to look at your workforce and what you're trying to do. Um, you may want to think about what your current employee vaccination rate is and why or how much you would want to improve that. Um, if employees refuse vaccination under a mandatory vaccination policy, are you willing to terminate them if they don't have a religious or medical exemption? Um, because in some workplaces, that may be a large group of people. Um, will that cause a, a problem for your workforce if you have to face that? Um, if you're going to offer incentives instead, what kind of incentives do you wanna offer? How will you treat employees who may have a medical or religious um, exemption from vaccination and who still want the incentive, you should plan around what you want to do for that. Um, and no matter what kind of policy you have, how will employee morale be implicated by that? Um, there, If you have a mandatory vaccine policy, there are going to be some employees who don't want to be vaccinated. If you don't have any policy at all, there are going to be some employees who are uncomfortable with that and don't want to come into the office unless everyone is vaccinated. Um, and whatever middle ground you seek, I'm sure that there will be somebody who will find fault with whatever policy you have created. Um, 
So you have to think about what, how will you work with those people um, as you're considering the next stage of your operations. Um, just like we were talking about with masking, social distancing, if you have a vaccination policy, it needs to be enforced consistently. Um, so you should give thought to what that will look like and who will administer that. Um, and again, we highly recommend a written policy if you're having a policy at all, just to make all the expectations clear so everyone's on the same page about what that would be. Um, so. If you want to have a policy or if you're thinking about a policy or if you do have a vaccination policy, you may want to know which employees are vaccinated. Um, and knowing how many or which employees are vaccinated can also be really helpful in determining whether you actually want to reopen or have a policy in the first place. Um, you know, if all of your employees are already vaccinated, you probably don't need to offer them an incentive. Um, so um, the probably the question I've been getting most often recently is, can I ask? Can I ask my employees if they've been vaccinated for COVID? Um, and the short answer to that is yes. You can ask your employees if they've been vaccinated. Um, but that is kind of the end of the inquiry for the most part. Um, you can ask if they've been vaccinated, but you shouldn't be asking follow-up questions about why not, why haven't you been vaccinated? What would it take to make you go get a vaccine? Um, because if there's no business necessity for them. Um, the question of whether or not a person has been vaccinated is not considered a medical inquiry, the EEOC has said it's not likely to elicit information about a disability. But if you start asking questions like, why haven't you been vaccinated? You might put someone in the position of, of being forced to say, I have a disability that prevents vaccination um, or something else that would be a, an impermissible medical inquiry under the law. Um, so yes, you can ask if they've been vaccinated. Um, you can also ask for proof of vaccination. As long as that proof you're asking for itself doesn't have medical information on it. So you can ask to see a vaccine card or like a printout from the pharmacy where they got the vaccine saying they received it. You should not be getting and should not ask for any um, information or having any documents that contains um, those pre-vaccination questions. Like, do you, you know, have you had an adverse reaction to a vaccine in the past? Are you pregnant? All the questions that they ask you before you get the vaccine, you don't want that information. <laughs> you just want to know, have you been vaccinated? Yes or no. Um, and as you're kind of considering how to approach this, think about why you're asking the question, um, because really just curiosity isn't a, a strong enough business reason. Um, if you're thinking about you know, how many of my employees are vaccinated, is reopening feasible? Um, maybe you could get to that answer if you did a, a anonymous survey rather than asking each employee individually. Um, that's kind of a less invasive way to get the information and might make employees a bit more comfortable with the way you're asking. Um, if you're trying to track compliance with a vaccination policy, you'll need to know who has individually who has and who hasn't been vaccinated. Um, you should think about who's the person collecting that information, where do they store it, and who has access to it, um, because you want to keep it as confidential as possible. That information about whether your employee has been vaccinated um, it would be confidential medical information um, that you need to keep separate from their regular personnel file, and that should only be shared um, with folks on a need-to-know basis. Um, so kind of think about what you're trying to accomplish if you're asking this question, have you been vaccinated and can you show me proof of vaccination um, and let that guide the least invasive way that you can get that information from your employees. Um, the I've also gotten a lot of questions about reporting vaccination rates. Um, so, you know, can you report to your workforce, you know, 80% of our employees are vaccinated? Um, generally, reporting a number in the aggregate like that is okay. Um, if your employee comes to you and asks, can you tell me if my office mate has been vaccinated? The answer to that question is probably no. Um, you shouldn't be sharing employees' individual uh, 
medical information and their vaccination status would fall under that. Um, so even though it's a question you may get a lot, um, we would not suggest sharing the in which individuals have been vaccinated. Um, at this stage, there are also a lot of questions remaining about how we treat vaccinated individuals compared to unvaccinated individuals. And that's one of the reasons that I suggest um, kind of seeking the least invasive way of asking the vaccination question and sharing it only with those who have a need to know. Um, you know, if your supervisor or manager doesn't know which individuals are vaccinated or not, it removes the possibility that they're discriminating or favoring employees who are vaccinated or unvaccinated over the other group. Um, and while being vaccinated or not is not a protected class, it does run very close to a lot of the protected classes um, like religion, pregnancy, and disability. So um, you want to be careful with, with how that information is treated and how you're treating people differently based on their vaccination status. Um, obviously, a very big question, um, and if you have specific uh, follow-up questions, something we're happy to talk about individually, um, or you can call your own attorney. Um, and e even in the absence of a mandatory vaccination policy, you should be thinking about accommodations and what that might look like if you want to, to reopen your office. Um, so there may be some employees that are uncomfortable returning to work if they're not vaccinated, and those may be employees who are at high risk for COVID or maybe immune compromised. Um, and, and you will want to make sure that you're evaluating those kinds of requests for accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act as well. Um, so not just looking at those people who may not be able to get vaccinated, but even people who are at high risk or immune compromised might get the vaccine and, and not have it be as effective um, and may want a reasonable accommodation for that disability as well. Um, and then in a minute, I'll talk about how even if employees aren't legally entitled to an accommodation, there may still be things that you need to consider uh, from a morale or an employee relations perspective about how to work with those employees um, in, in light of the, a decision you may make to reopen your office. Um, um, so someone I see a, a question before I move on um, was asking, how does one enforce a vaccine policy and the exemptions if we shouldn't ask these questions? I'm not saying don't ask the question about whether you've been vaccinated or not. That's a question that you can ask and get an answer to. Um, so if you have a mandatory vaccine policy, you'll obviously need to ask your employees, have you been vaccinated? And you may need to get them to show you proof of vaccination. Um, but what you'll want to do is keep that information kind of close. So you may want to have HR collect that information instead of each supervisor. You don't want to publish a list to your entire workplace of, you know, so-and-so is vaccinated and so-and-so is not um, if they don't need to know. So it depends on the policy you're going to have, but you want to make sure that you're um, enforcing your policy in a way that's going to be uh, to kind of make sense in proportion. Um, so, you know, if you have, if you don't have a vaccination policy, collecting proof of vaccination from all your employees might be overdoing it. Um, so it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish and the least restrictive way that you can get to that. Uh, okay, so let's assume you've made the decision now that some or all of your employees will be reporting back to the office. Um, what kinds of things should you be thinking about? You know, you've made this decision, it's going to happen. What are the uh, potential problems that you should anticipate? Um, so first, let's just tackle the question that this is some or all of your employees. You don't have to bring back every employee. Um, if you're bringing back a group of people, um, for some reason, this group is is better, it's more necessary for them to be in the office, you still have to at least approach these questions for that group of people, even if you're not requiring all employees to return. So you may end up doing a lot of analysis depending on how you're structuring your return to the office. Um, 
Okay, so um, if you've decided people are going to come back physically to your space, um, the first question you're go probably going to get from a lot of your employees is, can I still telework? Um, there's a good chance that your staff members have been working remotely now for a while, and there are some that are probably really anxious to get back to the office, um, but others maybe not so much. So if they've been operating remotely for a year, you'll probably have at least some people asking whether they can continue. Um, so in some cases, those individuals will have a disability that you'll need to analyze whether remote work is a reasonable accommodation for them. I mentioned this just a few minutes ago. Um, you know, some people might have disabilities that make returning to work difficult or more difficult now in a COVID environment. Um, of course, you may have had some people who even before COVID had remote work as a reasonable accommodation. Um, so you'll need to look at those cases on a case by case basis and engage in the interactive process um, to determine whether remote work is a reasonable accommodation for them. Um, and you may end up getting more of these requests um, in a post COVID environment than you did before. Um, especially now that remote work has been the norm for so long, you should consider whether remote work is more or less reasonable as an accommodation now than it was before. Um, so you may have denied remote work a year or two ago for an employee who had a, a disability and was looking for a reasonable accommodation saying that you didn't have the infrastructure for remote work or you had certain concerns about their ability to work outside the office. And the answer to that question might be different now than it was before the pandemic. If you've improved your technology, if employees have all been issued laptops that they didn't have before, maybe remote work is more possible now than it was before. But um, it doesn't have to be, yes, remote work for everybody, just because a position was done remotely during COVID. If there's a business reason that you have for wanting a position on site, you still need to look at whether you can deny remote work um, for a specific individual for their specific disability. And the answer might be, you can't have remote work for a business reason that makes a lot of sense now. Um, but know that as you're looking at these decisions, you're going to have a different set of employee expectations than what you faced pre-COVID. Um, you'll also probably have some requests for telework for non-legally protected reasons, and you should have a plan in advance for what to do with those. Um, are you going to allow full-time telework for employees who want it for any reason? part-time for certain reasons for a number of days a week. Um, Jennifer is going to talk about what you might want to consider if you're implementing permanent telework for your staff. Um, but if you're requiring employees to come into the office, you might need to consider some of these same considerations um, if they're asking for remote work in lieu of coming into the office. Um, you may also deny telework and require everyone to come back to the office full time. That is kind of the, the vision that maybe you have if you're reopening your doors. Um, but that isn't without its own problems. Um, what if you have employees who moved during the pandemic to a different state away from their home office place? Um, can they report to a, if you have a different office, can they report to a different office? Um, do they have to, to report to the office to which they were hired? Um, or will they just be terminated if they can't show up in person now? Um, and then what happens if that person was one of your top performers and is now you know, living six states away and can't make the trip? Um, think about these things in advance because you want to be able to consistently grant requests to telework or not um, if they're made for non-legally protected reasons. Um, so it, it could be difficult to say no to a top performer, you know, you have to move back or you're going to lose your job. Um, but that that may be the decision that you need to make in order to have kind of a consistent policy um, in lieu of a lot of the things that Walter and Jennifer are going to talk about later. Um, you should also consider what your full-time return to the office will mean for employee morale um, and employee relations and come up with a really deliberate communication strategy about what that's going to look like. Um, so 
how will employees respond to your approach to vaccines? You know, if you don't have a policy, will there be employees who are upset about that? If you have a mandatory policy, will there be pushback on that? Um, and if so, what will your response be to those employees? Um, you know, are you willing to terminate employees for not physically coming back to the office? Do you have kind of a grace period in mind where you might give them some leeway? Um, in, no matter what your policy is, there's going to be somebody who's unhappy about it. I can almost guarantee you that. Um, so you need to think about how you'll respond to that person and what you are willing to do. Um, and again, consistency is really important here. Um, once you make the decision to return, you need to be prepared to stand behind that decision um, and then to communicate it in a way that your expectations are clear to all your employees. Um, so once you announce that reopening, you may learn, you know, that employees have moved away temporarily or permanently, or maybe you hired someone while your workforce was remote and they haven't moved to your area yet. Um, will you give them some transition time? What will you do if they don't come back? Um, Maybe they haven't moved across the country, but now they have a much longer commute. Like, is that going to create a different problem than, than you may have expected to have? Um, you know, maybe they need parking now and they didn't need parking before. You may want to think about how what that's going to look like if you have limited parking at your organization. Um, uh, and that's that's true, I think, across the board because transportation is going to look different when employees start returning to the office. Um, if a lot of your employees came on public transit before, they may feel less comfortable taking public transit now, or hours of service may have changed really drastically during COVID. Um, maybe their bus route was just cut entirely during the course of the pandemic. Um, and this might create problems that you didn't have before. So is this something that you need to anticipate? You know your workforce and uh, kind of their commuting patterns a little better. Um, will you need to have more flexible operating hours in order to accommodate this, this sort of change in employee commuting patterns? Um, along with kind of other ongoing pandemic related concerns. Um, if you were to open today, there are going to be employees who continue to have childcare issues. You know, some schools are still virtual, others have limited hours. Um, even the ones that are open have much stricter policies about uh, student illness. So kids may be home more often than they were before. And this may mean that their parents, your employees have to take more sick days uh, in order to stay home. Uh, some employees may themselves need more sick days or may be making more leave requests when you reopen your doors. Um, I know a lot of people haven't had a cold or a cough in like over a year because we've been so busy protecting ourselves from COVID, we haven't gotten like the regular flu either. Um, but once you start getting everyone back into the office, um, that will probably change and you will likely want your employees to stay home if they're not feeling well. Um, this may mean that they're taking a lot more leave than they were pre-pandemic because they'll, they'll stay home for something that may have before been considered minor, but now is could be the beginning of a COVID infection. Um, so what will that look like? And do you need to adjust your leave policies in order to accommodate that increased absences. Uh, will you treat vaccinated employees any differently when it comes to uh, you know, whether or not someone has to stay home if they have uh, any symptoms? Um, and then you know, will you allow employees to travel for work? Um, which ones? Uh, if your employees travel for personal reasons, will they need to report that travel? Does it matter where they go? These are all questions that, you know, they don't have one answer, but they're questions that you should be considering if you're going to be opening your doors. Um, and as with so many things, communication is really the key. Um, you don't need to anticipate every contingency or plan for every question, although you do want to think about what your employees' main concerns will be and have a plan to address those. Um, but if you communicate early and often and make your expectations clear, you're going to put your, your workplace in a much better position um, than if you kind of drop all this in your employees' lives. Um, at what will seem to them like the last minute. Um, 
So think about your communication strategy as you're planning to reopen your doors and, and what that will look like and what that will need to look like for your employees to feel comfortable coming back. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer to talk about um, tele permanent telework. Great. Thanks so much, Robin. Um, and for those of you who are taking this course for CLE credit, the code is remote two zero. Two one. Um, so, as as Robin mentioned, you know you're probably getting a lot of questions about whether you're going to permit telework in the future after the pandemic's over, or maybe even receiving specific requests about permanent telework from some employees. And you know, now that maybe your nonprofit's been operating efficiently and productively over the past year, you're thinking, you know what? Permit telework arrangements may actually be a really great idea for a nonprofit. So what do you need to be thinking about if you're considering implementing these permanent telework arrangements? Um, go ahead, next slide, please. Um, as Robin said, you know, before I get into the specifics, um, what you want to make sure that you're doing is telling your managers, wait, let's hold off on granting or denying telework requests until we have a clear plan about what telework is going to look like for our organization in the future. And the reason why you don't want these managers to make these kind of off-the-cuff decisions is because a lot of these off-the-cuff decisions lead to inconsistencies, which open the organization up to um, discrimination claims as well as potential employee relations issues. So make sure you just tell everybody, let's let's pump the brakes. Don't, don't grant any requests until we get a clear path moving forward. So you'll need to develop a strategy about how your telework arrangements are going to look like. So you, you'll want to ask yourself the four following questions. You want to determine who is going to be eligible for telework and will the telework be offered on a part-time and or a full-time basis? Um, do you have a current policy um, or that needs to be revised or do you need one? And And then finally, how are you going to be documenting the telework arrangements, if at all? So step one to developing a, a telework plan is, is everybody going to be able to telework? And if not, which employees are going to be permitted to telework? Now, if you decided that all employees are going to be allowed to telework, you just need to move step to step two. That's easy. However, if not everybody's going to be given the telework option, you're going to need to determine what criteria you're going to apply in order to determine which groups of employees would, are going to be eligible for the telework option. Developing you know, objective criteria is going to enable the nonprofit to defend against potential discrimination claims and really will decrease the overall likelihood that you're going to have employee relations issues. Because even though your employees ultimately might not be happy with the objective criteria that you come up with, at least you have the objective criteria to point to as far as how the decision was made. So when you're looking at what eligibility criteria you may use to determine who's going to be allowed to telework, you can look at a couple of different things or a combination of things. But again, the idea is to make sure they're consistently applied to all employees. So you could take a look at an employee's exempt or non-exempt status from the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, a lot of times because non-exempt employees are paid only for the hours that they work, you know, a lot of times employers will say, you know, I think it's better that the non-exempt employee report to the office for work. That way I can make sure that the hours that are worked are properly recorded. I can um, control overtime a little bit better when they're in the office and, and the like, you know, and, and then in contrast, a lot of employers don't have the same feelings about non-exempt employees because of course they're working the same salary regardless of the amount of hours that they work. So from time to time, employers will distinguish the telework option or the eligibility criteria based upon that exempt or non-exempt status. Um, you can also look at an employee's job title or level within the nonprofit organization for your um, eligibility criteria. You know, you could say, all directors and above are permitted to telework, but associate directors and below are not permitted to telework. Um, you certainly can examine and should an employee's job duties to determine whether the duties are conducive to a telework option. I mean, for example, an office services employee whose duties include sorting through mail on a daily basis, 
it's not going to be conducive to telework, right? Um, however, if you have an employee, maybe an IT employee who doesn't need to be present for any meetings, um, doesn't need to be present in the office and doesn't physically fix any computer hardware, then telework may be an appropriate um, option for that employee. Um, one thing that you want to um, be aware of, if you're going to use job duties as the only criteria in determining telework eligibility, you want to make sure that you're treating all employees with similar job duties consistently and in the same manner, meaning you're going to give all employees with similar duties, the option to telework or not, um, it's going to avoid, you know, again, the discrimination claims and complaints about favoritism. Um, some, some nonprofits may find that the telework eligibility uh, criteria could be based upon a department or division within the organization. Um, for example, you know, everybody in our marketing communications department, we're all online, there's no need for us to be physically present for the office, so we're, everybody in the entire department is going to be permitted uh, to telework. Um, you certainly can use employee performance as an eligibility um, factor in determining the telework option, but you should make sure that if you're going to use that as an option, uh, I'm sorry, use that as a criteria, you're going to want to make sure that any lack of performance is documented if you're going to rely on it to disqualify that employee for the telework option. Um, and this may be a little tricky for, for some um, nonprofits who may have, you know, had the employee um, performance evaluation kind of fall by the wayside in the past year with, uh, with the pandemic in place. And then finally, it, it's certainly fine to solicit your managers to provide input on which position should be eligible for telework, but you're going to want to designate at least one or two individuals within the organization who has oversight over the entire plan so you can make sure that the decisions are consistently made, like I had mentioned. Um, so in addition to these eligibility criteria as part of your telework strategy, you'll want to consider the second step, which is the basis on which telework can be offered. Is it going to be offered on a part-time or a full-time basis? Now, I have some clients who will say, you know what, as long as our employees are doing their job, they don't have to come into the office. So in that case, you know, maybe a full telework option is the right choice for your organization. But I'm talking to a lot of nonprofits and I'm hearing that you know, nonprofits, a lot of nonprofits do want to have their employees have some type of office presence, right? So if that's the case, you're going to need to decide what that presence is going to be necessary for your organization. So for example, are employees going to have the option of teleworking every other Friday? Are they going to have the option, you know, coming in once a week or, or twice a week? Again, you just have to make that decision. So two, two points of caution here. Um, first, if, an, if your nonprofit is not going to offer the same part-time and full-time arrangements to all employees eligible for telework, um, you'll want to use the same factors that we just discussed for determining eligibility for, for, for the telework option in the first place, right? Again, we want consistency in saying this group of employees are going to be offered the full-time telework option, and here's the criteria that we applied. And these employees will be offered a part-time um, telework option, and this is the criteria that we use to, to reach that. Um, and second, if, if you're considering um, an alternative work schedule in lieu of the telework option, um, and, and that's when you know maybe over a, a it's a compressed work um, two I'm sorry it's a compressed work week option, um, and maybe you'll have an employee work nine days um, over a ten day work schedule um, and they'll work longer hours to meet their hours requirements, you want to make sure you structure it in a way so that you're going to avoid and or minimize overtime. So now that you've decided who's going to be eligible for telework and whether the telework is going to be offered on a part-time basis, what do you need to do next? Yes, you've already thought of it. Uh, you have got to draft a written telework policy. Um, as Robin said, you know, documenting policies is just so important and enforcing them. Um, and that policy is going to help set employees' expectations and, again, minimize those employee um, relations issues. 
So some of you may already have a telework policy in place. Um, if so, just take a look at it, make sure it, it doesn't need updating in light of your new path moving forward, if there is a new path. Um, for those of you that don't have a telework policy or a bare bones policy, you'll, you'll want to draft a new policy. And, and again, that policy should include the following elements. You know, who is eligible for telework, how the telework quest should be submitted, um, the expectations regarding the home office environment, um, maintenance of uh, nonprofit-owned equipment and confidential information, um, you know, the, addressing the fact that telework can't be used as a substitute for paid time off if you know, the employee's ill or has dependent care issues. Um, and you certainly want to make sure that you retain the right to cancel telework relations uh, uh, arrangements if it's, if it's not working well. Um, and you should also consider establishing within your policy um, an employee's core working hours. Um, a lot of times I'll have clients say, you know, we don't really care what hours the employee works um, as long as the work is getting done. And that might be fine for your other organization, but it, it may make sense to say, you know what, everybody needs to be, anybody who is teleworking needs to be available for the hours of 11 to 3, meaning you need to be online. That way, I think it will smooth over and um, ease communications between coworkers and, and things like that. Um, and then finally, step four, as part of that telework policy, you're also going to want to consider creating forms that can be used to document the telework relationship. Um, you can develop a form that employees can use to submit telework requests, and then a second form that can be used for approving that telework arrangement, and that can set forth the employee's approved telework schedule so there's no confusion. Um, so for part-time workers who are going to be required to maybe report to the office maybe only twice a week or three days a week, you could have just maybe a one-page approval form that sets out their teleworking days and makes that clear, and then a brief acknowledgement that they've read the policy, um, and then they need permission to change their telework schedule. For full-time remote employees, um, you might want to consider a more formal agreement um, that lays out all the expectations and includes the location from which they are going to be teleworking, and we'll get into why that's important in a little bit. Um, now, I know that documenting each employee's telework arrangement may seem a little burdensome, um, but I do want to explain why I think it's important for both the employee and the employer. Um, first, the documentation is going to clearly set expectations on the employee's telework schedule. You know, pre-pandemic, from time to time, I would receive calls from nonprofits related to employees who telework, and they, they would say, oh, well, you know, the employee is calling in last minute and changing their schedule, and you know what, we had, you know, purposely scheduled an in-person meeting on that day because we knew that they were going to be in and they don't show. Sometimes um, the employee will say, oh, well, I didn't telework on a previously scheduled telework day because I had to come into the office. I want to try to roll it over, you know, to the following weeks and use it. And, and it can become a little burdensome for the employer. It can be frustrating sometimes for the supervisor as well. So if you set that schedule out clearly and set expectations and make clear, hey, you know what, if you're going to deviate from the schedule, you just need your supervisor's approval and then everybody can be on the same page. I also think the documentation is going to be really important from the employer perspective because it is going to document that the, the telework arrangement is really for the convenience of the employee and not for the employer. And I'm going to explain why this is going to be a little more important, uh, very important in a little bit. But it really is important to have that to show that it's the employee requesting the arrangement as opposed to the employer mandating that the employee uh, telework for the employer's um, convenience. Um, if you could change to the next slide, please. Um, so if you ultimately decide to implement these permanent telework arrangements. Um, in addition to reviewing any existing policies and drafting a new policy, um, it's going to be important to review your employee handbook to see if any policies need any updating. So, for example, to the extent your anti-harassment policy doesn't do so already, it should clearly state that the policy applies to anywhere that the nonprofit's business is being conducted, including where any telework is being performed. Um, I think that this is probably 
seems obvious maybe to a lot of you out there, but you know, given the harassment issues that we all heard about, and quite frankly, in the news that arose from this pandemic environment, I really do think it's probably worth repeating in your policies. Um, similarly, you take a look at your dress code. Um, should it include a statement that say, you know, employees are expected to dress appropriately when working remotely and appearing on camera for you know your nonprofit business? Um, that may be worth we're stating in there. It may even make sense to hold a brief training session on, you know, operating in a remote environment or appropriate um, appropriate behavior in the teleworking environment. And, and while I know that a lot of us have been working in a remote environment for the past year, um, a lot of things that we've, we've been dealing kind of with larger issues. So this may have been a back burner issue that we thought maybe was just obvious to the employees, but, we should, but it may make sense to move forward, you know, moving forward to do some training on this. You could do some training to say, you know, talk about the appropriateness of virtual backgrounds, um, which should and should not be shared when you use the share screen feature and the annotations feature on electronic technology platforms. Um, certainly the appropriate use of the chat feature during uh, virtual meetings. Um, and you could also make clear that sweatshirts and bedhead are not appropriate for when you're on camera for your nonprofit business. I think it's also worth taking a look at your current performance evaluation system. Um, you know, should there be an increase in the level of frequency of performance evaluations? Maybe you move from an annual performance evaluation to biannually or quarterly, um, because sometimes in the remote environment, supervisors have more difficulties addressing performance issues, and they're kind of more easily ignored. So maybe upping the frequency of performance evaluations can, can solve that problem. Um, also, sometimes you might need to revise the employee's goals if they are moving to a, a remote environment. Um, are they still appropriate? Is there anything that needs to be added or, or revised? And then finally, go ahead and talk to your managers. Ask them if there's been any issues that are you know, unique to this remote environment that they've been operating in um, related to employee performance and management. And, and maybe if there are, um, you know, you can figure, take that and address them um, in the context of you know, policies moving forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so now what I'd like to talk about next is the potential employment law implications of these telework arrangements. And then Walter's gonna take it and talk about the tax implications. And, and I wanna say at the outset, the potential issues that I'm gonna talk about really have always existed with regard to telework arrangements, even before the pandemic. Um, but because telework arrangements that were in place prior to the pandemic were fewer than what we're gonna probably see after the pandemic is over, and they were less formalized telework arrangements, you know, the enforcing agencies, you know, probably didn't put a whole lot of focus on making sure that any potential, you know, any applicable employment laws were actually enforced with regard to these kind of fewer, less formalized remote um, arrangements. So for example, it, it probably wasn't really worth the time for a state Department of Labor to take action against an employer who had one full-time remote employee in their state, but they weren't, you know, paying the minimum salary threshold in order to be exempt from their state wage and hour laws. I do think that there probably is going to be a change moving forward, though. At, the pandemic has brought teleworking to the forefront in a way that has never taken place in, you know, in our history before. And I really do think that this new focus is going to also be a new focus for um, some of these enforcing agencies. So we do wanna be mindful um, as we're moving forward with these telework arrangements, what laws could potentially be um, implicated by this. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the specific laws and I don't wanna take up too much of Walter's time, but I do wanna say, at the outset, when you're looking at these laws, at least from the employment perspective, you need to have two things in order for the law to apply. There has to be employer coverage as well as employee and coverage. coverage. And unfortunately, the state laws are going to vary as to how 
coverage for employees and coverage of, of employers are, are defined. So you're actually going to have to take a look at the laws. You know, some employment laws will say in order for an employee to be covered by this law, they have to work in our state at least 50% of their work time. Other laws will say an employee just has to perform some work in our state to be covered. But then you also have to have the employer coverage as well. And, and again, sometimes the law will say, oh, you just have to have an employee in our state. Um, other times the, the law will say employers, need, this law only covers employers who have you know, a certain number of employees who are working in our state. So let me give you an example. So a law may provide, it covers any employee who performs work in state A, but the law also says it only covers employers who have 10 or more employees in state A. So if the nonprofit has less than 10 employees in state A, the law is not going to apply because you don't have employer and employee coverage. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the specific types of laws now. The first law that's potentially implicated are state wage and hour laws. And I'll tell you at the outset, oftentimes the coverage for these wage and state wage and hour laws is very broad. Um, so you know what you'll need to do is be mindful of any applicable minimum wage requirements, as well as any minimum salary thresholds that are required in order to be exempt from that state wage and hour law. So in California, um, even though under the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act, the employee needs to be only making $35,568 annually to be exempt from the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act, in California, in order to be exempt from the California state wage and hour laws for employers with 25 or less employees, the employee has to be making $54,080. So again, you would still be, so you would be, the employee would be exempt from the federal wage and hour law, but not under California if they are making less than that 5480 mark. Um, you'll also want to take a look at those uh, wage and hour laws to see if there's any meal or rest breaks that are required for your non exempt employees. Uh, you'll also want to take a look at paid sick leave laws. Um, numerous states, counties, and cities are requiring um, employers to provide paid sick leave to employees who perform work in, in their jurisdictions. Um, now, now, I'll say this, Be because the a required amount or the amount that's required by law is oftentimes not significant. Most of the time, an employer's existing paid time off policies or paid sick leave policies are going to be sufficient to meet the minimum requirements of the state, but it is definitely something that you want to keep in the back of your mind. Um, you'll also want to look at kind of like the more administrative requirements, I would say. Um, are employees required to um, be provided with a notice upon hire or upon separation? In D.C., um, the D.C. Wage Theft Prevention Amendment Act requires an employer to provide a notice of hire form to every D.C. employee, and that contains specific information about their exempt or non-exempt status and, and their pay rate. In Georgia and New York, employers have to complete a separation notice form and provide it to their employees upon termination. So that's definitely something you want to think of as well. Um, Walter's probably going to touch on this a little bit more, but you'll also want to be mindful of expense reimbursement laws. Um, there are a couple of states who have actually passed um, state reimbursement and uh, business expense reimbursement laws. California has one. Illinois just recently passed. Um, a lot of those laws vary in language, but many of them focus on whether in, whether the expense was incurred for the convenience of the employer or for the convenience of the employee. And so if it was incurred for the convenience of the employer, then it would be a, um, a, a reimbursable business expense. If it was for the convenience of the employee, the employer could take the position that it's not a reimbursable business expense. Again, you'll want to take a look at the laws because they are they, they do vary. And then finally, um, you'll want to take a look at um, the laws and the guidance regarding uh, accrual of paid uh, time off. So California used to be the only state in which once 
paid vacation time was accrued, it couldn't be forfeited, meaning you couldn't have a use it or lose it policy and you can't have caps on carryover from year to year. But California isn't the only state that has this anymore. There are a number of states that are kind of following suit. So again, you'll want to take a look at those, see if any of those apply to your remote workers. And if so, Upon separation, they're going to be able to, they're going to need to be paid out for any accrued unused leave, and you want to make sure that you don't have a use it or, or lose it policy that applies to them. Um, now, that concludes our employment portion of the present employment law presentation of the uh, presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to Walter now. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Robin. Um, turn to the tax side. This is admittedly going to be a somewhat narrower band of interest perhaps in the broader employment law side because it's really going to hit on the situations where employees continue to work remotely in the future and in particular are working in a different state from the state where the employment office is. And to go back to something, well, this Jennifer hit on, it's not a new topic. This has been around, I've been answering these questions for years now, but the telework situation has increased the volume and the, the awareness of this topic like never before. So these topics have just started coming up in my practice a lot more. Um, there are really five different components. Uh, once you bump one slide on along the way there, Robin, if you would. Um, five different sort of subtopics. It's often just one or two of them come up together, but it's hard not to deal with all five of them. And I'll try to hit on all five generally and kind of get three of them off the agenda pretty quickly. So we try to make sure we allow a little question time at the end for question and answers. But the five sort of topics that always come up are, we now have an employee in a state different than we had before. What does that mean with respect to, well, one question is, do we have to register to do business in the state? Uh, second category is, does it have anything to do with our, our tax reporting as an entity? Should we be filing return? We file this form with the IRS every year, 990. Should we be filing something with this new state where we now are acknowledging that we're permanently going to have some employee working there? For some nonprofits, they sell things, and it raises a sales tax topic of, do we now need to be collecting sales tax on a product we sell or service we sell because we now have an employee in the state. And then the last two of the five are both the payroll topics of, well, which state should we be withholding for this employee with respect to, given that they're working all the time, part of the time in a different state than the one that we've treated as their employment state in the past. And linked in pretty closely to that is the unemployment insurance premium topic of which state do we pay our unemployment insurance premiums to. Um, and hit on the first three of those kind of as a bundle. They tend to be of less concern to nonprofits as a generality. Uh, the doing business topic is really not a tax topic per se. It's really more of a corporate law topic of you've got a nonprofit. It was formed under the laws of the state of Maryland. It's now going to be doing business in the state of Virginia. Well, Virginia doesn't respect you as an entity unless you register. And you get in, we could spend quite a while discussing what that means. But for the most part, it's not a lot of significance to whether you do or don't register unless you really are having a lot of activity there beyond just one employee. In similar vein is the income tax registration. I'd say as a practice, merely having one employee that's sort of not doing anything that's really of a true, strong, active nature for the business, the nonprofit in the state, typically isn't going to trigger the filing of a tax return. And it sort of becomes a circular topic on tax returns because for most nonprofits, they're going to, if the state were to come and say, we well, should be filing a tax return because you are a corporation and corporations file tax returns and pay taxes, the nonprofit would respond, well, we're a nonprofit, we're not taxable. The state would say, you got to file an exemption application, you file the exemption application, and the result would be you don't owe any tax and you probably don't even have to file. The one exception always to be aware of is to the extent you engage in un unrelated trade or business activity, you may actually have a real tax liability. And if some of that activity relates to a new state where the employee is now putting you on the radar screen, that can become an issue. 
Um, and uh, slide along one more slide if you would, probably in the 14 there. Uh, the sales tax is much in the same vein. And a lot of these are nexus topics of does the employee in the state give your organization enough connection with that state that the state can assert that you should be doing things like filing a tax return, or if you sell a product or service that's taxable in the state, is that employee's presence in the state now putting you over the threshold of activity that obligates you to collect tax in that state when you didn't before? Um, and for any of you who do business in Maryland, or not do business in Maryland, sell anything that's digital, Maryland is sort of out on the forefront just recently of broadly expanding their, their digital sales tax. And this is a trend we're probably gonna see more of that if the only thing you've ever posted on your website is that somebody can pay you $10 to get access to some of your video content, this is now a new hot topic of sales tax being triggered. And it may mean if you now have an employee suddenly in Virginia that you never had before, I'm sorry, in Maryland that you never had before, you may be obligated to collect Maryland sales tax on anything digital being sold into the state. And this is a trend just to be aware of in the future, in particular, is the extent you acknowledge having employees in more and more places. So those are kind of the big three sort of core tax topics. And they all interrelate in that if you register to do business in a state, it's typically going to put you on the radar screen of the taxing authorities who would then be expecting to file a tax return, who would then be expecting you to justify why you're not paying taxes to the state. And the sales tax authorities also make query whether you need to be filing sales tax returns with respect to anything you either buy or sell in that state. So those are all kind of bundled together. What's probably of more general interest is the actual payroll side of this and what happens particular to the employee being in the state where you didn't before have an employee and their tax consequences. And um, Slide on the next slide, if you would, uh, 15, which comes at the different perspectives we've got on the employer, the employee, and the state. The employer is often worried about not having contact with a state they didn't have with contact with before, so as to avoid all the things Jennifer talked about, as well as wanting to avoid having to do any tax compliance that may be necessary in terms of filing more tax returns, payroll tax returns, having to potentially answer audit questions from the state. Uh, and that's all in contrast with the employee who may, and this has been an inter interesting topic over the past year in particular, where a number of times we've had employees who affirmatively wanted to be identified as connected with a different state where they wanted to assert residency, largely to avoid state income tax. You know, the classic extreme example is they lived worked Maryland, DC, Virginia, New York, wherever, or in California. And they now have a relative who's in Florida or Nevada they're living with. And they've discovered the wonder that nobody around them when they're living there is paying income tax because those jurisdictions don't have income tax. And they realized, gee, if I could take up state residency here for this year and going forward, I can avoid paying any state income tax. But it comes very back to the very practical topic of what their employer is doing with withholding in the first instance. Is their employer treating them as a resident of Virginia or New York doing the withholding such that that state to begin with is going to assume that they are a resident and they're going to have to go through a fight with the state as to why they now deserve to get the tax back. So employees often, not often, but may well have a different perspective of affirmatively wanting to be a resident in their remote state and wanting to stay there and spend most of their working time there. And then of course, there's the state taxing authority, which the constant mantra I hear year after year is states always want more revenue. They always seem to be getting more into debt and needing to get more revenue and always looking to maximize whatever state taxes, the sources they can. There's been a lot of the theme of, in my perspective, I like the phrase invisible employees. Again, this has been going on for a long time, but for the most part, employees who work remotely, one, there was no outward showing to the world that they were there. It was not like they were going out and putting on their front of the house, a label for their, their organization, that this is now an office for the organization. There was no holding out on letterhead that their home residence was an office for the, the organization. And so there's no general awareness of it. Um, and there was also, they didn't do anything that really 
their presence in the jurisdiction didn't really serve their employer in any way. Those two prongs have always been sort of the, uh, the invisible employee. They, they weren't there selling product in that jurisdiction because the employer wanted them there. They were there for their own convenience. And all that sort of has meant this really didn't show up very well to the state taxing authorities. And it also the volume, if they audited a given individual, wasn't going to result in much tax. So it sort of has been ignored largely by the state taxing authorities, which happens in a lot of different areas. Um, and this had been one. Now that there's much more of an awareness of it and the numbers of remote employees have gone up a lot, it may well be one that we see more enforcement activity from the states going forward with respect to. Um, uh, once you slide on the next slide, uh, this is a little overview of when you head down the payroll and unemployment insurance, sort of understanding how state tax works to begin with for the individual. It's just a useful knowledge base to have is the two prongs of state taxation are one, if you live in a state, you're a resident of that state, that state will claim the right to tax you on all your income, at least for any of the states that have income taxes. There are a few wonderful states, seven or so of them, that don't have income taxes out there. But in general, the theme is if you reside in a state, it will tax you on all of your income. Totally apart from that is a state in which you work will claim the right to tax you on the income from your compensation for working in that state. So typical example, you live in Maryland, but work in Virginia, Maryland's gonna claim the right to tax all of your income. Virginia's gonna claim the right to tax your income from your work in that state. And where this leads in broad brush on the payroll tax side of things is to generally the payroll tax withholding will be with respect to the state of work and not the state of residence where the two are different. Um, there are a few places across the country where there are reciprocity agreements which override that and the greater DC, Virginia, Maryland area are three jurisdictions which have a reciprocity agreement which say that um, the withholding can be done only with, can be voluntarily done only with respect to the state of residence so that the employee avoids what is otherwise the typical situation of filing a tax return in Maryland, reporting all income, having withholding done for Virginia, and then having to pay a, file a Virginia tax return also with respect to that income, and then come back to Maryland and claim a credit on their Maryland return for the Virginia taxes paid. That's the usual structure if there's not a reciprocity agreement is having to file in both jurisdictions and claim a credit. But from the employer standpoint, it's a matter of strictly doing withholding in general from the state for which uh, the uh, place of work is occurring. Um, to try to move us right along, why don't you slide on over to the uh, slide 18, which is the unemployment insurance topic. Um, unemployment insurance typically is going to get you the same result most of the time as payroll tax, income tax withholding, but the rules are phrased differently and much more precisely in that there is a generally uniform set of unemployment insurance rules which have come into play that begin with a simple theme that if all work is done in one jurisdiction, and what you see on this slide is DC's rules for to which jurisdiction does DC expect you to pay unemployment insurance premiums, that if all work is um, done in one jurisdiction, uh, it will be considered localized in that jurisdiction and you'll pay there. And it's where the work gets split among two jurisdictions that you sort of move to rule two and ask, well, where's the base of operations or where's the control coming from? And typically flip back to that place if rule two kicks in. So what does that mean in practice? Well, it means for a given employee, you ask, well, where are they actually doing most of the work? And in the situation where they are working primarily out of the office, historic type situations, then that's gonna be the place to which unemployment insurance is paid. At the opposite extreme, if you now have an employee who you've hired uh, with your main offices in the district, but you've hired them or permitted them to work remotely in Colorado, 
And that really is where they work all the time. They don't commute into the DC office in any way for any significance other than just occasional sporadic visits to team up with colleagues. Then their work really is localized in Colorado and the payments would be to Colorado. And then the mixed situation is gonna be the one in between where, well, they spend a few days a week at home in Maryland, but the rest of the time they commute into DC is the one that you then say, well, that split between the two states, is there a base where their operations are based from or a place they're controlled from? And typically there's gonna be a fairly straightforward answer. Well, that's DC, there is an office, that's where the supervisors are located. That's where they would return to when they're returning to a home office. So in those situations it can be DC that continues to govern the uh, unemployment insurance coverage. Um, why don't I pause there and go ahead and let's flip on to questions. That's kind of a broad coverage of the five key topics we've got on unemployment. The, why don't you slide quickly to the last slide here, which is one big point to note is the, what's happened over time is we've had the pandemic, we've had a number of states come out with guidance. Go to slide 24. Um, a number of states have come up with guidance as to what to do during the pandemic. Uh, more states than that have either said nothing or said, no, we're gonna stay with our historic laws. But this website that the uh, CPAs provide tells you the guidance that's out there by each state during the pandemic. Um, the one thing we can be pretty certain of is this pandemic and emergency status winds up. Uh, these, what's available is these guidance will revert back to historic approaches, which is pretty much just what I walked through. And then there may be some more degree of aggressive guidance that comes forward to deal with the greater volume of remote employees that are out there. But uh, let me pause there and see if we've got some questions to deal with. Jennifer or Robin, have you looked at these to see whether there's some to be spoken to? Uh, sure. Um, so, so I did see one um, question, which is a really great one. Um, the, the question was, you know, we're a smaller nonprofit and we don't really have the capacity or the bandwidth to do a 50 state survey of whether, you know, the employment laws in all 50 states are going to be applicable. You know, how do we keep up with this? Um, I really, that, that is a great question. It is difficult to keep up with it. There are certainly services out there right now. Um, they could be cost prohibitive at this point. My guess is that after the pandemic, there will be more readily available services at um, lower cost for this very situation. Because even if you don't have, you know, you know, aren't talking about just implementing these telework arrangements, employers are really moving to generally hiring employees all over the country and allowing employees to be 100% um, remote. So I really do think that there'll be more um, you know, cost-friendly options. Walter, how about you? Did you send any ones that... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump to one of the questions that I did see here, which really goes to the more nuanced situation, which is more difficult question to address, which is sort of the really on the payroll tax side of it, I'll come at from it, mentions the insurance side. Um, the insurance side, maybe at least the unemployment insurance side is probably a very easier piece of it, is if you have an employee who is clearly, you've got a policy in particular that says they can work part-time from home, you've clearly acknowledged with them that they're gonna work part-time from a different location, a different state. And so it's clear that they're both working in the office at times and from home at times. Unemployment insurance is going to throw you to one of the two clean answers I just talked through, which is one jurisdiction you pay the premiums to based on the localization rule one or rule two kicking in. The income tax side can get more nuanced in that uh, you could end up in a situation where the, the right answer is to do payroll tax withholding for both jurisdictions in that for an employee who works in two different states, the technical answer is that they should be allocating their income between those states, often on days worked in one state versus days worked in the other. So that if they get paid $100 during the year and 30% of their time is in Virginia, well, Virginia can claim the right to tax 30% of that and 
Maryland, the other 70% if that's the two state split. So there are situations where employers, the perfect answer in the perfect world would be to do withholding for both states for that employee that splits based on what the perceived split of their time between the states is gonna be during that year. I think that's probably much less common than just withholding for their base state where the office is and then letting them deal with their home state as they do the tax return. But there, again, there are differences in practice and the facts are taking different directions on that. Great, thanks, Walter. Um, I think that we have reached our, our, the end of our, our webinar. Uh, we're at our time limit. So um, on behalf of all the panelists here, I just wanted to thank you for um, participating and this will be posted on, on our YouTube channel. So you can go back and rewatch it um, if you like. Um, and thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful day.